Dr. Panya has conducted extensive research into the nature of consciousness and its relationship with the brain during cardiac arrest and clinical death. He'll be providing an introduction to the Human Consciousness Project, as well as its first study, AWARE, AWARE of Resuscitation, launch of the symposium held at the United Nations in September 2008. Dr. Peter Fennick is Senior Lecturer at the Institute of Psychiatry, King's College London, and associated with the Mental Health Group at University of Southampton. He's also a consultant neuropsychiatrist at the Maudsley and at the Johns Ratcliffe Hospital in Oxford. He also holds a visiting professorship in Japan where he spends three months of the year in advanced neuropsychiatric research. Before I hand you over to Dr. Panya and Dr. Fennick, can I thank the Cascade Society of Imperial College for assisting in organizing this evening. And also, as has now become customary, can I ask everyone to turn off your mobile phones? <coughs> Dr. Sampan, yeah. Dr. Peter <clears throat> First, though, if I may, just in case I get a frog in my throat. Well, I wanted to, first of all, thank everybody for coming here. It's a wonderful opportunity for us to talk about a subject that I find fascinating, um, the nature of the self and consciousness and how it relates to the brain. And what we thought we would do tonight um, is to first provide a little outline of the subject for everyone, and then we'll have a panel discussion. And I've invited uh, three eminent uh, uh, physicians and psychologists, two, psych uh, two physicians and a psychologist to join us for, for this panel discussion. But I think before we do that, it's important to go through this. So if I may, uh, I'm just going to go through a little historical perspective on the subject of the self and consciousness, um, and then we'll go on to the panel discussion, and then we'll have time at the end for questions and answers. Right. Okay. Um, the first thing I wanted to just really discuss with you here and to, to emphasize here is really what we mean when we talk about self and consciousness. I don't know, I know that people here are from various backgrounds, so some people may have studied this either professionally or out of interest, uh, some people may not have. So if I may, I just want to start by defining what we're talking about really. And what we're really referring to is essentially who we are. The, co the collection of our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions. If you think about it, we're all conscious beings. And right now, as I'm talking to you and you're listening to me, we're interacting through our mind and our consciousness. So you're listening and you're thinking about what we're discussing through your consciousness. And essentially, it's everything that makes us into who we are. And if you think about it, really, from the moment you were delivered as a little tiny baby, a bundle of joy to your parents... Somewhere along the line, you developed a sense of self, a sense of awareness of who you are. They named you something, in my case, Sam, but really from a very young, unique personality which has developed until today. And as you grew up, you learned more and more, and more from your environment. You played with your parents, with your friends, etc. And that's really led to who you are today. And as we look back in our lives, as we get older, we start to think about really what does it mean? In other words, what, what, what is it that makes me into who I am? Where do my thoughts come from? Why am I different to somebody else? Why, are, why is there so much variability uh, in human personality and behavior? And what we realize essentially is that the self or consciousness is really everything that makes us into who we are. It's that unique aspect of every person. And it's very relevant because if you think about it, everything that we're engaged with in daily life, every moment of our lives, takes place through our consciousness. So if somebody's interested, just start with at work. Everything we do at work takes place, our interaction with our colleagues, our boss, takes place through our mind and consciousness. If we're interested in the arts, again, we appreciate arts through our mind and consciousness. If we're into music, we appreciate it through our mind and our consciousness. If someone's into the sciences, like Einstein, again, you, you, you get into sciences through your mind and consciousness. And if someone is interested in virtue, doing good deeds, 
Again, we have to learn to develop that through our mind and consciousness. And also it's very important for our judicial system because we have free will. And so we're judged based upon the decisions we make through our mind and consciousness every day of our lives. And so it really impacts everything. And what I wanted to highlight here is that this is not just some esoteric subject that was discussed in philosophy many years ago or is studied academically by certain people. It really relates to every single one of us, every moment of our lives. And it really is a big scientific mystery. And thankfully, science has become interested in studying this in recent times. And who knows, maybe one day we'll be able to discover the nature of this self or consciousness. But what we also notice about the human mind and consciousness and is that it's very different. Although it has similarities, we have very many similarities with the animals, but we also have some things that make us unique. So although we have instincts, like any animal, but we also have reasoning and rational thought, we are able to create. So if you think about it, you look at the animal kingdom, you see that any species that you care to look at really hasn't changed very much, although they may have evolved, but they haven't changed very much in the sense that we have changed. So we started out from cave dwellings, and here we are today in a wonderful, comfortable lecture theater, and we have scientists who are studying the minute details of cells, you know, smaller than an atom. And on the other hand, we have scientists who are sending lunar um, spacecrafts or spacecrafts to Mars, and we're exploring, you know, the sort of the mi micro level of the universe and also the huge macro level of the universe. It's something in us that really seems to distinguish us from the animal kingdom. And it's difficult to know what that is because genetically we're not very different. Um, our brain structure isn't very different. That's why we do all these experiments on animals to find out about how the brain works. But somehow we seem to have faculties that distinguish us from an animal. We also have free will and therefore we're responsible for our actions. And we seem to be the only species that's interested in morality and ethics, and in some cases, an exploration of the divine. So we see that from ancient times, people have been interested in something, something above, whether they believe in the divine or God, or whether they don't believe in it, but there is an interest. Um, and nobody, I think, could say they've never thought about that concept. And it's interesting, you look back at cave pictures and cave dwellings, you see that they've drawn these sort of matchstick pictures when they were very primitive, and they seem to be worshiping, some, worshiping something above. And it really has continued from all those thousands of years until today. And we're also unique because we have transcendent behavior. We can overcome our instincts if we want to. If we try hard enough, we can. And so we sometimes sacrifice ourselves for somebody else. We do extraordinary things that we don't really see very much in the animal kingdom. But as I pointed out, biologically speaking, we're not that different. So it's interesting, and I don't have an answer as to why we're different. That hopefully will be part of our panel discussion tonight, but we seem to be different.